Good morning, everybody. Whether you're joining us by Zoom or telephone or seeing us belatedly on Facebook, welcome to our morning service here in Monmouth on this wonderful, glorious, sunny day. We thank the Lord for that sunshine and all his other blessings and gifts. We welcome to lead our service, Andrew Webster. Welcome, Andrew. We look forward to hearing what you have to say to us. So welcome to our service and let's have a short moment of quiet and then a prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence. We thank you for the opportunity to draw closer to Christ and to the Holy Spirit, gifts for which we are ever grateful, Lord. Lord, we thank you for Andrew and his call to ministry. And we thank you that he is here to lead us today, to bring us ever closer to you and your majesty. Lord, we ask blessing upon him and upon us this day in the name of the dear Lord, Saviour, Jesus. Amen. Welcome, Andrew. Mike, thank you and good morning, everyone. On oh, this beautiful, beautiful day. We're in the season where we're in the Easter season, so our call to worship from 1 Corinthians 15. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all shall be made alive in Christ. Our worship continues with our first hymn. It's Singing the Faith 269. 296, Christ has risen whilst earth slumbers.
let us continue in prayer. Blessed are you, sovereign Lord. You are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To you be glory and praise forever. From the deep waters of death, you have brought your people to new birth by raising your son to life in triumph. Through him, dark death has been destroyed and radiant life is everywhere restored. As you call us out of darkness into this marvelous light, may our lives reflect his glory. May our lips repeat the endless song, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it is natural as we bring our praise and worship to God that our hearts overflow with thanksgiving. So let us raise our ourselves, our voices, our hearts in, a, in an attitude of gratefulness this morning for all your blessings that are freely given to us, Lord, for all that has enriched us, for all that has made life so, for all that is precious, all that is valuable, all that is life-giving for life itself. We bring our heartfelt thanks this morning and for the the blessings that often we maybe take for granted or make every day so much more precious. Thank you from the depths of our heart. And if we are sometimes slow to appreciate, especially if sometimes we are slow to worship and give you glory, Lord, then we also come with an attitude of repentance, recognizing that we are, we are very much works in progress, recognizing that we, we do fall short, Lord. But as we will be hearing in our gospel message, for those who come to you, who turn to you, who repent, there is forgiveness of sins and restoration and renewal and are being put right with you. So, Lord, for this, we give you thanks indeed. For this, we give you praise that for all that you have done in the death and the rising of Christ, that you know us and we can know you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And as our worship and praise continues, our, our psalm for today is Psalm number four. Answer me when I call, O God, of my rights. For you gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honour suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed... Do not sin, ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when grain and wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, O Lord. Make me lie down in safety. Amen. We continue our worship with our next hymn, which is Jesus is here.
Amen. Just before we hear our, um, our readings for today, a, a story from a while ago that um, I think fits with what we're going to hear. I was in my second year at uh, a theology college, uh, training diligently um, to, to be a minister, and our placements had started with uh, stepped out of the lecture theatre into uh, into placements with experienced ministers to learn to learn what it's really all about. And I was I was blessed to be with a um, experienced minister who she's originally from Nigeria now uh, working in Britain, and uh, she was she took me under her wing. A couple of months in, it was the first time we were called quite late at night to a to a hospital visit, and I'd done hospital visiting before. But this was somebody who was um, who was about to die, uh, an older member of the congregation. She was a, a devout Christian, and the family had asked for the minister to go. And uh, so I was actually I was, I was quite excited, quite nervous because it was my first um, deathbed, I suppose, as as a minister. First time I dressed like a minister, and uh, and I went with my my um, my senior, my supervisor. And we went in, and if you've ever been in those situations, there's, there's a slight awkwardness of people sort of standing around and um, children and various family members. And um, my minister, that was Vicky, she was called, she said, right, so we're going we're gonna to pray now. And I was, I was ready for that. We prayed in silence. And we could see that the doctors came in, and it was probably minutes to go before this person died. And she said, right, here you go, Andrew, here's your chance. And I was already, because we'd done the lectures on, on what you might call the last rites, prayer with a dying, I was already, and I was looking for the page in a book, and I was trying to remember a good psalm, and I was, I was, I was trying to fumble, and I was trying to remember some, some sort of prayer that might bring comfort to the family at this very, very particular moment. And then she looked at me and said, Andrew, get a grip, man. I want you to pray for healing. 
I, 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 I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say, you see, because I'd all come ready, prepared for somebody dying, and she felt very strongly to pray for healing. And I, I was lost for words, and I ummed, and I ahed, and I fumbled, and I dropped my Bible. And she, she said, just, oh, get out of the way, leave it to me. And she, and she laid hands on this dying person, and she prayed, and, and the person whom we're praying for was physically restored. She was expected to die, and she didn't die. Not only that, she regained consciousness and lived for another week. And that challenged me. It challenged me because having had lots of lectures on why really, you know, we're a bit, you know, reason and rationality and why we should be careful praying for healing and ooh, restoration of health. And and, um, and what the tutor said, what my supervisor said to me was, she said, don't never, no, she said, always leave some space for the miracle God wants to work. And it's not for us to tell God what that miracle might be or might not be, but let's not shut down some of the possibilities. I'll tell you more about that week that that lady was given when she was restored to health. But we're going to have our first reading now, and this is from Acts chapter 3, and it follows straight after a healing miracle, the first healing miracle of the church, really, um, after, after Pentecost. And it's from Acts chapter 3, beginning at verse 11. It's Peter's sermon after he's done a healing. Thank you. Peter speaks to the Jews. The beggar was holding on to Peter and John. All the people were amazed. They came running to them at Solomon's porch. When Peter saw this, he said, men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us? We haven't made this walk by our own, this man walk by our own power or godliness. The God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob has done this. He has brought glory to Jesus who serves him. But you handed Jesus over to be killed. Pilate had decided to let him go. But you spoke against Jesus when he was in Pilate's court. You spoke against the holy and blameless one. You asked for a murderer to be set free instead. You killed the one who gives life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses to this. This man whom you can see and know was made strong because of faith in Jesus' name. Faith in Jesus has healed him completely. You can see it with your own eyes. My friends, I know you didn't realise what you were doing. Neither did your leaders. But God has given a promise through all the prophets. And this is how he has made his promise come true. He said that his Christ would suffer. So turn away from your sins. Turn to God. Then your sins will be wiped away. The time will come when the Lord will make everything new. He will send the Christ. Jesus has been appointed as the Christ for you. Amen. And uh, we'll hear our second reading now, which is the gospel, which is from Luke chapter 24. And this is the... Uh, the evening of Easter Day is just after the encounter on the road to Emmaus. And this is on Luke chapter 24, when the risen Jesus meets his followers. Thank you. The disciples, the disciples were still talking about this when Jesus himself suddenly stood among them. He said, may you have peace. They were surprised and terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you have doubts in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet, it's really me. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have a body or bones, but you can see that I do. After he said that, he showed them his hands and feet, but they still did not believe it. They were amazed and filled with joy. So Jesus asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of cooked fish and he took it and ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, this is what I told you whilst I was still with you. 
everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must come true. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer. He will rise from the dead on the third day. His followers will preach in his name. They will tell others to turn away from their sins and be forgiven. People from every nation will hear it, beginning at Jerusalem. You have seen these things with your own eyes. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but for now, stay in the city. Stay there until you've received power from heaven. Thank you for that reading. And inspired by both those readings, shall we sing our worship again with 357, 357, Jesus the name. Let's worship God's. It's a great privilege to uh, to lead services any time of year, of course, but particularly Easter and after Easter, it's the, the passages uh, 
I suppose every every sermon ought to have a, a, an echo of Easter. But when uh, we're looking at these passages that are about resurrection, it's uh, it's very hard to keep just to one um, one sermon. So uh, um, I will try I will try my best, and I'll do that by focusing to start off with on the physicality of these passages. If we, the author of both passages uh, is, is Dr. Luke, and maybe that's significant. It's significant because the, the physical dimension would appear to be very important. The, the, the physicality of what's happening seems to be something that Luke really wants us to hear. So when it comes to the scriptures, symbol, metaphor, spiritual interpretation, all those are vital to understanding the truth of Scripture. But also, there's a physical dimension to the gospel. You see, the resurrected body of Jesus is, is fleshy, it's corporeal, it's material, it's touchable, it's somatic. And yes, I did click on my theosaurus to get all those words, but it's something touchable. That Jesus was recognizable, although not straight away, is an interesting observation. The fact that the taste and touch was, was involved in, in this and other resurrection encounters. But not only a body, but more than a body. More than uh, a resuscitated corpse or something that's been revived. There's, a, there's an extra dimension to the physicality, not, not like Lazarus, who's, who's been to death and come back, who will one day die again, but the same but different, very real, very physical, but also something else, uh, a Jesus who can appear in rooms where the doors have been locked, a Jesus, and this, this intrigued me this, this week preparing this, that this encounter in Luke is, it's just after. It's the same evening of, of, of Emmaus. You know, the two followers have walked to Emmaus. They've encountered the risen Jesus in the breaking of the bread. They realize they've met Jesus, and they run all the way back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples that they've seen the Lord. Maybe it's seven or eight miles. They run all the way, and just when they get there, the same risen Jesus is there. And, and I'm intrigued. It doesn't really matter, does it? But did Jesus himself run, or could he move in a different way? Was, it, was, he, was he panting and breathless like the disciples? Was he... There's an extra dimension, but the physical is part of this resurrection. Maybe in a way that the lead of a pencil is, a, is the same as a diamond, but it's totally different, but it's transformed, but it's still somehow the same. But if you accept what Luke wants us to know, that there's a physical dimension to resurrection, and that does have big implications for how we experience God and, and how we practice our faith. It's saying to us that, that, that this world and our lives are the arena for God's activity. The, 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 the arena where God wants to renew and restore, reveal his presence. The, 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 the triumph over death, the, the draining of the power that death has over us. Well, that's to be worked out in the here and the now. That the Christian faith is not an escape to a disembodied somewhere else. It's not a, you're perhaps familiar with the, the Gnostic heresy that, that was very much to doing down the physical realm was about a spiritual purity. It was an escape from the world. Not at all. Just as the incarnation was just about, was about God embracing creation so too the resurrection is a continuation of that embrace, that it's here in this world that God is at work. So just as the incarnation came in the, the individual Jesus Christ, because of the resurrection, because of his teaching here of sending the Holy Spirit to clothe his people in power, so too the incarnation continues in the church, the body, of Christ, which is to make manifest the resurrected Jesus. And in this reading, as well as establishing the, the physical resurrection, the, the, the being preparedness to, to, to eat the, the flesh and the bones of it, to eat fish, to, to, to be touched by his followers, 
We're told that Jesus opened the minds of his followers to understand the scriptures and promised the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that was to be the work of the church, to explain how Jesus' death and resurrection has now fulfilled what scripture promised. And that by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue his incarnation ministry. And that's exactly what's happened in Luke, in, in Acts chapter 3. The, we call it in, in scriptures labeled the, um, the, the crippled beggar, which sounds a bit pejorative, doesn't it? But we're told the crippled beggar at the beautiful gates had the strength of his feet and his ankles restored. It's the first healing of the, of the church post-Pentecost. It's the, well, it's where we, just before our passage, we had the most famous line where this man is begging and, and, and Peter famously says, we have, I have no silver nor gold, but I, what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. A very powerful, emotive sentence from scripture. But we're told that the man was, was made strong in his legs and he could walk and he began jumping. And we're told that he was walking and praising God in the temple and he was, he was jumping and people were filled with wonder and amazement. So the promise of Jesus to clothe his followers in power has come to pass. But also the understanding of the scriptures. And that's what we hear now in the, the, the sermon, if you like, that, that Peter gives to the, to the people who gather, witness the miracle, who want to come and hear more. All that Jesus had promised in the upper room in Luke 24 is now coming to be fulfilled. It is a continuation of what Jesus had done. All those miracles that he fulfilled, where we're told that many people were in, in wonder and amazement, well, this started to happen in Acts. So if we say this is the arena for God's activity, can we affirm that, that the idea of being physically restored is something to be desired? That it's actually a wonderful thing to have our health regained? And the theology I'm sharing with you and these stories from, from Luke and from Acts have been the, the impetus for, for, for countless thousands of Christians to pursue a life in medicine and nursing to go into the, the caring professions in this country and worldwide for centuries. The, 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 the importance of being well is central to our gospel. And, and, and if you're ever on the receiving end of, of good care or good treatment, if you've ever experienced illness and experienced restoration of health, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. If it's from a... Um, when I was doing this, I was thinking about last time I was ill, I had a horrible toothache and, and there's nothing quite or as horrible or in my, I'm a bit soft really, I don't do pain, but, but to, to suffer terribly from a toothache and have that sorted out, it is a wonderful thing. When my dad had his hip replacements, it's become a bit of a cliche, hip replacements, but life had been miserable for, 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 for months, for years. And, and he said the minute he had his hip replaced and the pain had gone, a bit like the guy in the, in the beautiful gate who was jumping up and down in the temple, he wanted to do that, to experience the restoration of health, to receive good care. And perhaps I want to add to that the good care given in thousands of care homes around the country where, where people's bodies perhaps have been hurt or harmed or damaged. Perhaps with the aging process to, to be looked after is very much part of God's holy purposes. And amongst this ministry to the body of health and wholeness and restoration, there is surely to be an element of prayer for restoration of health through prayer or the laying on of hands that perhaps is an under underutilized ministry in the church but it's very much there in the new testament if you go back to my experience as a student minister and my fumbling and um, very inadequate attempts to pray for somebody i think perhaps sometimes we've so rationalized so brought the powers of reason to our faith as we should do and use our minds that god has given us that sometimes there's been a reluctance to allow God to do what God wants to do with us or through us. 
and my experience from that hospital bed with my supervisor and other other experiences since is that for all wanting to have a um a credible faith whatever that might be then to leave room for a miraculous events that's demonstrated physically to pray for healing there ought to always be space for that and recognizing that that comes with with issues and and and, and things we need to think through but it was very clear that when this healing was fulfilled in acts that Peter's very clear it's nothing to do with any power he has nothing to do with any human power nor was it anything to do with the strength or lack of strength or lack of faith on behalf of the person who was healed but it was all the work of God so let's leave some room let's seek that to be part of our ministry but let's also recognize that when there is physical restoration when there is a cure that's only one element of what later we're told in acts 3 16 that there's a um, um perfect health or complete healing see as with jesus's miracles there's always a deeper meaning and a purpose there's the miracle itself but there's always a reason for it it was never just a case of jesus showing or demonstrating power for the sake of it there was a, a deeper truth at work and perhaps that deeper truth is ultimately more important. So, for example, in the situation I described where a, a woman on a deathbed was restored to health and consciousness for a week, in that week, she has some very important things to say to her family and for them to say to her. She has some important things to say to a minister and the minister say to her that, that there might be a deeper healing within her spirit, that her eventual passing was incredibly peaceful and it wouldn't, wouldn't have been if it'd come much sooner. You see, if we link together these passages in both of them, Jesus and Peter talk about repentance, about reconciliation with God, about receiving forgiveness. And in this, we get to the very heart of the matter of, of, of the gospel, of, of the being put right with God that's now possible because of the resurrection. And perhaps that's where deepest healing resides in, in verse in verse 16, as I say, my version, it says perfect health. Another version says complete healing. There's something about the depth of God's activity within us that affects complete healing, which ultimately, whether we live or whether we die, is we've experienced the wholeness that God can bring to our lives. And that might well involve a physical restoration, but it always involves something even deeper. Because, of course, the reality is all of us will experience physical decay and all of us will experience physical death. But because of the resurrection, we need not experience eternal separation from God, which is what the great gift of the resurrection is to us. One more thing. One more thing about that resurrection passage we had from Luke 24. And I think it's the part of this healing, this deep restoration of ourselves with God, comes about when Jesus meets us in our brokenness. You see, if we're saying that this world and our lives is the arena for God's activity, if this is the arena for God's restoration of lives, renewal of lives, healing and wholeness, then this begins with a God who in Jesus meets us in brokenness, who meets us in our unfinishedness, in our incompleteness, in the as we are-ness of life. You see, in these passages, as are in our lives there's a lot of frayed edges there's plenty of work to be done within us and it's jesus's own brokenness that makes this possible 
You see, as Luke is a great pains to emphasize the physicality of the resurrection, that, that Jesus has gone through death and he's come through the other side and it's a physical re restoration of, the, of, of Jesus and, and that he's got this, uh, another dimension to his physicality and, and all of that is fascinating that the resurrected Jesus still bears his wounds that the brokenness of Jesus, as his attention is drawn to his hands and his feet, and in John's gospel, also his sides, that, that he, he's gone through death and triumphed over death, and yet he still bears his wound. And perhaps it's this woundedness, this brokenness, is the place where he can connect with our lives. It's where Jesus can connect with our hurting and harmed world. You see, all that happened on the cross is still within Christ. All that, not just what he did, not just to achieve, but that very experience is taken up into God now. So that's a God who can understand and can connect with us in our damaged and broken world. Peter's the great example of this, isn't he? If somebody who was very unfinished, very incomplete, who knew brokenness, who knew restoration, who here ex demonstrated a wonderful miracle and preached a, a fantastic sermon, and yet he still had so much healing to undergo, so much more work to be done, and so much more to learn. Just before the Luke passage, in a road to Emmaus, we're told that his followers recognised Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Because of the brokenness Jesus endured for us, his life can connect with our lives in the places we most need him to connect with us. Because of the cross and because of the resurrection, there's this tremendous hope that we are not forsaken, that we are not, God is not remote or distant or far away, but a God who is with us and at work with us, should we open our broken bits to him. So can we affirm the physical dimension to our ministry and mission, whether that's if you're called to the, the healing ministries of, 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 of medicine or nursing or care? In this, can our, our church life, can we, can we leave space for prayer, for physical restoration? Should it be God's will? And if today you are feeling a bit frayed at the end, frayed or fragmented or struggling, or if brokenness is your experience, then perhaps the wounded healer who is Jesus, the scarred Messiah, may because of his wounds, may you know your healing and may his life connect with your life, that you may partake in his resurrection life. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, grant us an awareness of your presence with us in the depths of our hurts, of our struggles, and in faith, help us be open to healing and renewal and restoration on whatever level of our existence that might be necessary. Grant us a deeper understanding of who Christ is with us, a deeper understanding of what he has done for us and what he can do for us. Grant us a deep sense, Lord, that limited and frail as we often are, you are the resurrected Christ who meets us where we are and takes us to be with you. So may healing, may completeness, may wholeness be our experience in the name of Jesus. Amen. And a hymn to reflect on some of this, we're going to now sing most merciful God. We have sinned, we have walked our own way, 
Our love has been fickle. Our hearts they have strayed. So Lord, in your mercy, forgive us, we pray. Merciful God, our Father of grace, we confess we have sinned, we have walked our own way, our love has been fickle, our hearts they have Amen. I'm going to share in some prayers now for the world. And after I've spoken, I'm going to leave some space and silence where we uh, can bring our own prayers to God that's on our heart or simply be quiet and open before God that God might do what God wants to do. So let us pray. On this day that the Lord has made, let us pray for all people everywhere, particularly those in need. Loving God, help us to live as those who believe in the triumph of the cross. Lord, will you grant us a renewed and deeper understanding of what it means to follow a risen Jesus Christ. That the 
the resurrection might be manifest in our lives, in our church, that we might reflect something of the meaning of resurrection to the world, to the communities where you have placed us. Grant us to be a people of great hope, Lord, that we might look at the world in all its, yes, beauty and majesty, but also its struggles and injustices that, inspired by resurrection hope, we make life lives that's, that make a difference. We do lift before God those who today are seeking to bring justice. Those who are seeking to bring a, a, a fairness, a godly, holy fairness to the world and the distribution of resources. Those who today are striving against illness and, and suffering in any way. Praying for those who work in our health service, praying for those around the world who do amazing work in very trying circumstances. Praying today especially for those who work in our care homes, which are not always the highest of profile and yet do immensely important work. May your spirit strengthen and guide and inspire. And in a moment's quiet, lift before the Lord anybody you know who is in need of health and healing. Lift before God any situation where, where our prayers are needed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we do pray for those for whom death has come to their families, those who are now separated but not eternally parted. Grant the peace, Lord, that you alone can give to those who grieve. And for all those, Lord, for whom life is nearing its last chapter, may there yet be restoration and depth of healing. Lord, help us not to shy away, not only from the ministry of healing, but also from this this call to repent, to turn to you, to, to receive restoration of our lives, which is your gift to those through your mercy and forgiveness. So we pray now for those perhaps we know who are, who are in trouble, not just in body, but in spirit or in mind, those who are just, just not right with themselves and, and not right with God. That through us or through some other agency, they may have this opportunity to make their peace with you and thus receive the, the depths of healing that you long to get. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we pray for those who mourn, we remember the queen who laid her husband to rest yesterday, that with all that's in her unique situation, knowing that she is a woman of faith, that you may be her comfort at this time and for all her family. We do pray for those in leadership who have decisions to make, that they may lead with integrity and wisdom and a courage to do the right thing for all people. Heavenly Father, we are very thankful the, the vaccine is rolling out in our land, and we're grateful for that. We do pray that in parts of the world where there is great poverty and undeveloped infrastructure, that there might be a generosity from those with wealth and power to those who have neither. That this may yet be a chance to, to all the trouble that's come, a chance to be a more compassionate and united world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, we pray for ourselves, recognizing we are all a work in progress, that, that there are things that trouble us as much in our lives as often doesn't feel right. Lord, grant us a vision of Christ with us, resurrected, but by his wounds, a life that can connect with ours, by his wounds that we might be healed. Grant us today, Lord, and in the days to come, a sense of your presence with us, that your guidance is forever with us. 
that your son invites us to know him, to receive his forgiveness, and that we can walk in his ways. According to your will, Lord, may it be so. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And let us, each of us in our own houses, join together now in the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn is 338, There is a Redeemer. Almighty Father, in your great mercy, you gladden the, the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord. Will you give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life, that we may serve you continually in righteousness and truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing and peace of the Lord be with us all. Amen. <laughs>